Sam Guzman, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. So our listeners and viewers are going to be familiar with you because of the Catholic gentleman. Uh, and uh, let's start there. Let's start in terms of the website, the book, what came first and what really inspired you to form this, this brand that's been so successful for Catholic men. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the website started about seven years ago. Um, and as far as the need or where it came from, really just came kind of came from my own journey as a young man, trying to discover what manhood meant in this kind of confusing culture. Um, what's essential to it? What's not essential to it? How can I become a man myself? Um, and I certainly thought uh, as a young man that there had to be answers out there. Um, I ended up really just kind of going through a religious crisis and really seeking the truth and ended up converting to Catholicism right around the same time as I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what does this whole manhood thing mean? And so uh, I became Catholic and really started to crystallize what I believed it meant to be a man um, and started looking around for resources uh, for Catholic men. But at that time, and again, this was um, quite a few years ago now, uh, there wasn't very much for Catholic men when I converted to the Catholic Church. Lots of resources for Catholic women, um, not a lot of stuff for men. It was just kind of some tired, you know, worn out apostolates that were kind of defunct. They weren't really doing anything anymore, that sort of thing. Um, so I really wanted to fill that gap. Um, and it was during a prayer process that I had, you know, I was kind of going through a novena uh, in preparation for consecration to the Blessed Mother. And where I had a clear vision for a website for Catholic men called the Catholic Gentleman. Uh, just kind of went over to the computer, threw up that website on a popular blogging site and just started writing. And uh, the rest is uh, just kind of taking care of itself. Um, our Lady's blessed it. I believe it's kind of been her project because she cares for men. She wants men to flourish and succeed. Um, and uh, she wants to draw them to her son and make them like her son. Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, that's why I've been doing this for the past seven years. Um, really haven't uh, had any profound formulas or marketing plans or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's really just developed very organically uh, and become what it is today. And the book kind of flowed out from that. Um, how can I distill the essence of the Catholic gentleman into a, a book format that's easily accessible and, and, um, that you can carry around with you. So and that's where the book came from. And uh, it's just been a blessing the past seven years uh, to hear from men all over the world uh, who are rediscovering Catholicism, rediscovering um, perhaps for the first time the Catholic faith, mm. but at the same time rediscovering that men do have a unique vocation um, and they want to embrace that. So. And we need these images of, of our goal. You know, I know my 16 year old son, he said recently, he's like, can we talk more about the saints? You know, even he knows that yeah. there are certain men throughout human history that God has used in very particular ways. In your own conversion, Sam, were there a couple of male saints that you just felt like, wow, God has put this person into my life or across my desk for a reason? Well, one that came to mind um, right away, as you were saying that, was St. David of Molokai. Um, he was one that I discovered very early in my conversion process. I was at a Goodwill, I believe it was, and was kind of perusing their books, as I like to do. And uh, saw this little book, you know, Damien the Leper. What is this? Mm. Picked it up. It was about just this beautiful saint, St. David of Molokai, who... Um, went and lived among the lepers on uh, Hawaiian Island and ended up contracting leprosy in the process and really uh, living and dying with these people, but um, just kind of becoming an outcast with the outcasts. And I said, well, what a beautiful example for us men of self-sacrificial giving. Um, it's easy to talk a line about servant leadership or, you know, sacrificial leadership, but to actually get your hands dirty and live with these people and abandon any hope of ever coming back. Mm. Now that's a hero right there. Um, so saints like that, uh, St. Louis de Montfort as well, I just was really, he's a very masculine saint. You know, there's, yes, he had a deep devotion to the Blessed Mother um, and that um, more feminine presence in our faith. Um, and yet it certainly didn't make him any less of a man. 
think there's kind of a fear among some men that if I get too devoted to the Blessed Virgin, I won't be too manly. Well, that's absolutely not the case. Just learn about St. Louis de Montfort. This guy was a tough, <laughs> relentless, mm -hmm. uh, traveling missionary who faced constant hardship, sometimes even from the hierarchy. They were kind of persecuting him. Some bishops would chase him out of town, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet this guy was um, just relentless and he ended up spreading, you know, devotion, Blessed Virgin all over the world. Um, we all are remembering him today. We don't remember his persecutors, but we remember him. Uh, this guy was tough. So, you know, absolutely in no way does that compromise your manhood to be devoted to our Blessed Mother. So I, saints like that, this really woke my heart, um, you know, just a love of our Lord and the Catholic faith. And yes, her models to imitate, you know, we, Human beings learn through imitation. That's, that's how we um, learn as children, but it's how we learn throughout life. Um, and advertisers know this. That's why they put Michael Jordan and, you know, LeBron James and some of these athletes in front of us. Uh, they know we need models to imitate, but for us, those can be the saints, and that can really change us profoundly. Let's talk about you pray, your prayer on a daily basis. So take us through uh, an average day in the life of Sam Guzman, you know, from when you, you get up in the morning and um, what does prayer look like for you? Uh, start the day with scripture. Um, I really think scripture is kind of the hidden treasure in the Catholic faith. A lot of Catholics are skeptical of it. It's a big, the Bible's a big intimidating book. It can be a little bit overwhelming. Where do I start? Um, start with four Gospels. It's very simple. Just start there. Immerse yourselves in the words and example of our Lord. And uh, it doesn't have to be intimidating or complicated. If anything's confusing, there's wonderful study notes, study Bibles out there, scripture commentaries. Uh, just dig into it. Immerse your mind in scripture. It really will transform you uh, from the inside out. And one of the things I'm thankful about being Protestant is that um, I do kind of have a treasury of scriptures rattling around in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that. God's word is powerful. Um, so I start the day with that, you know, my morning consecration prayer, just give everything, you know, throughout the day uh, uh, to our lady to use whoever she wants. Um, and uh, throughout the day, though, um, you know, I usually take a pause in the afternoons for 20 minutes of just kind of silent prayer, just kind of clear my head. Um, just uh, center, you know, myself on, on, on God's presence. Because I think when we uh, look at some of the old prayer manuals and things, they always talk about this. Well, place yourself in the presence of God. Well, truth be told, that, that sounds kind of silly because isn't God everywhere in, at all times. But we're, well, what they mean is we're really bringing our attention and our awareness to God's presence. Um, and that's the goal. Uh, we're not, you know, placing ourselves in God's presence as if we could ever be outside of it, but it's that attention, that awareness. And taking that pause, that deep breath throughout the day, maybe just on the lunch break or, or wherever you have an opportunity, um, um, just bringing your attention to God's presence with you right there, right now. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking, God is with you. Um, that can be a beautiful exercise. Um, but if you don't even have time for that, I, I love what St. Paul of the Cross says one time. He was writing a letter of spiritual direction to someone who was distressed that they didn't have time to pray throughout the day. And he said, don't worry. He said, to act well is to pray well. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if, you're, you know, if you're an emergency room doctor and you've just got people in crisis all around you all day long, you're not going to have time for you know, a moment of silent prayer, most likely. Um, but to serve those in front of you with the right intention to please God and love God, um, that can be a holy thing in itself. So, so if you don't have time, don't worry about it. Just serve God with you know, the work in front of you with gladness and with joy, and um, you will be praying um, by your service. Um, and beyond that, uh, in the evening, we pray a family rosary. Um, of course, we always say prayers before dinners and that sort of thing as well, but we always uh, try to pray a family rosary. And I don't want to make it sound like uh, we have done this for four years straight without missing a night. Well, of course, we've missed of course, we, you know, the kids are tired or cranky or coming back from a trip or, you know, any number of circumstances that can kind of disrupt that rhythm. But that's always the goal. And no matter how many times we kind of fail at that, we always pick ourselves back up and try again the next day. And it's really become a beautiful anchor point in our family's life. The kids expect it. 
um, sometimes they, you know, I'm busy and I forget. They'll say, hey, Dad, can we go pray the rosary? And I'm just like, yeah, absolutely. Anytime. And, and you know, we really try to create a sacred atmosphere with incense and candles. And we have some, a beautiful home altar. Beautiful. So we really try to draw them into that experience. And, and they love it. So, um, you know, there might be a little resistance at first. But I would encourage everyone to try to get that rhythm. Advent's a great time to start. That's really when we started. One, one Advent, we're just like, let's start praying the rosary every night. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of stuck with it ever since. So if you're looking for a time to start, shoot for Advent. What do you say to a listener or a viewer who says, a home altar like Sam, I don't even know where I would start with something like that. So what's your, your two-minute tutorial on bu building or, or just kind of creating a home altar? Sure. Well, there's there's... Uh, lots of pictures online. If you just type in home altar uh, in Google Images, you'll come up with all kinds of or Catholic home altar. Make sure you put Catholic in front of that. Um, but uh, there's lots of images and examples. But really, I think the basics come down to a crucifix, maybe a couple candles, um, and uh, some pictures of um, a Lord or Lady, some of your patron saints, but some holy images that kind of lift your mind and heart to God. Um, and if you don't really, if you're really just stuck and you're just like, I have not a single design sense in my body, no bone, you know, my body. Okay. Well, imitate the church. You know, we're, we're the Ecclesia Domestica. We're the domestic church here. So look at your church's altar. How can you imitate that? How can you bring that into your home? And well, of course, while we're not offering mass, we're still offering prayers and, and you know, the sacrifice of praise to almighty God. And, we can very much imitate um, the church's altar in our home altars. Oh, that's great. Let's talk about, you have a busy home. You have four kids, a fifth one on the way. Praise God. Um, what's your strategy for a quiet start to your day? Do you get up before everybody else? Do you close a door? Do you have a prayer corner? What does that look like? I, I have to get up before everyone else because the minute those kids come tumbling down the stairs, it's it's pretty much chaos from, from there on out. Um, so yes, I try to get up before everyone else and uh, we have a handy dandy, uh, our kids are pretty young, but they have a little wake up light and until that light's on, they can't come downstairs. And they know that and it works great. Uh, but that gives me the space that I need to um, get, make a cup of coffee and you know, grab my Bible and kind of form that intention for the day where I want to um, serve and honor God with all the food today. Um, so yeah, I, I think it would be very difficult to do uh, when, when all the kids are awake. How hard is silence for you? Well, um, most of the time, it's not that difficult. Um, I do work from home, so it's not like I work in an office place where there's uh, lots of people circling around me. Um, that might be a little more difficult. Um, but for me at home, silence comes very naturally. I am not the kind of person that listens to music while I work. I don't listen to music in the car. Um, I try to create those oases of silence throughout the day. So if I'm running errands, I don't turn on the radio. I don't listen to podcasts. Um, I don't do that while I work either. So I, I try to just kind of tune out the noise a little bit, create some, some space. Sam, how about a spiritual reading? Uh, so you mentioned scriptures, which is so, so crucial. I totally agree with you. And we're so fortunate as Catholics because every day there's a mass celebrated and we have the readings. It's like a built-in curriculum. Are there, um, you know, some spiritual books that you recommend, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Time for God, whether by Jacques Philippe or, you know, I mean, gosh, we could talk for hours about this, but uh, what's what's in in your top one or two uh, <laughs> go to books for for just spiritual life and and also specifically prayer? Sure, absolutely. Well, it really uh, it is a very difficult question to answer because we're all in different stages in our spiritual life, and we all have different kind of gravitational pulls at different periods of our life. Early on in my conversion, it was all about apologetics. Um, later on, I kind of focused more on the spiritual life. But for me, the kind of top writings for me have been the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe. They're two huge volumes and they're kind of expensive, but wow, worth every penny. I've, I've just spent 
uh, hours pouring over those. And he never wrote a book, um, but we have thousands of journal entries, um, thousands of newspaper articles that he wrote. And so the newspaper articles are great because it's like he's trying to communicate the truths of the Catholic faith to completely um, uninterested secular audience, and he's trying to be persuasive about that. And it's, it's very informative and very interesting, um, and just some beautiful truths that he communicates. But his journal entries, on the other hand, um, and letters are just profoundly beautiful too, because it's just kind of the raw saint, you know, just what he was thinking, what he was feeling in those moments. So I, I would encourage you to look into the writings of St. Maximilian Colby. His, um, if you don't want to spend the money on his complete works, the, the Colby Reader is a great place to start. It's just a very short, condensed. Um, but beyond that, uh, Fulton Sheen is a wonderful place to begin as well, because he lived through almost every circumstance that we're living through right now. The kind of the tumult of the 60s, the rise of communism, lived through World War II, um, and throughout all this time, you know, just all these dramatically changing circumstances, he was trying to communicate the Catholic faith, again, to a secular world, a, sec a world that kind of was jaded and cynical. Um, and likewise, he was communicating the truths of the faith to Catholics who were often luke lukewarm and uninterested, were kind of, it was just kind of tired ritual to them. They didn't really mean, mean a whole lot. Um, Fulton Sheen is just tremendous. Uh, every one of his books, some of them are very short, very easy to digest. Others are longer, um, but they're all beautiful. And so I would say those are great places to start. But then, of course, just the great works of the ancient mystics and, and doctors of our faith. I mean, you can, you can get so much out of reading Church Father like St. Augustine or St. Jerome. Um, or a later, or a later saint uh, like Saint Teresa of Avila or John of the Cross. Um, so we have an incredible treasury. Those are just a few that come to mind. But just really immerse yourself. Spiritual reading can be incredibly transformational, um, and it can lead you into prayer. So if you're struggling with prayer, get a spiritual book and use it as a launch pad to prayer. Absolutely. Yeah. Sam, a uh, second and last question for you. Um, some of our listeners, some people watching this, are, are they've heard of spiritual direction. They have been to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I mean, I, I'm sure you agree with me that those are two just such core pillars of spiritual growth. What do you say to somebody who says, I don't have a spiritual director and I don't know where to start? And secondly, uh, maybe I should be going to confession more often. How do I know like, how often I should go? Sure. Well, let me start with the confession piece. Uh, first of all, how often should you go? St. Padre Pio says once a week. That might be a bit much for some people. Um, but as long as there's something nagging at your conscience, I would say, you know, if something's really bothering you, man, I just really blew it with my wife. Um, or I really just destroyed someone's reputation in a conversation by gossiping about them or something. Or, you know, I've just binged on pornography. Okay, well, there you go. Go to confession. Don't restore that peace of heart. Don't ignore it. That's the voice of your conscience, the voice of the Holy Spirit, um, asking you to make it right with the Lord. And he says, you know, and Jesus said in Scripture again, <laughs> um, that if you have, if, you, if you're aware of the fact that your brother has anything against you, make it right before you come and bring sacrifices to God. Uh, so before you go to Mass, just make it right if something's really bothering you. But beyond that, is it a mortal sin? You know, the conditions for mortal sin are pretty clearly outlined in church teaching. Um, so if you commit a mortal sin, then go to confession. It's pretty simple. Um, and again, there's plenty of resources out there that can help you understand what a mortal sin is and have you committed one. Um, there are some people who, who tend towards scrupulosity. They go to confession too much, but I would say most people don't go enough. Yeah. So I won't address scrupulous. But as far as, uh, I mean, your original question was, uh, what was how, what? how about about spiritual direction? You know, for, for yeah. somebody who um, they just, they haven't experienced spiritual direction and they're maybe sure. not even sure where to start. Sure. Yeah. So if you're fortunate enough, uh, like some of us to have a monastery nearby, um, or religious order, that's a great place to start looking for a spiritual director. I um, had a Carmelite spiritual director for some time, and that was, it was a very positive experience for me. Um, but we had a monastery very close to our home. Right now we have a Benedictine monastery very close to us, so it's going to be easy to, easier to find a spiritual director. 
If you're not, um, reach out to your parish priest. And if he says, you know, I'm too busy for spiritual direction, um, I would say just see if you can go to confession with one confessor regularly. That's a good kind of a middle ground. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we rotate around churches, you know, go here, go there, whatever has the most convenient time. But what can be helpful is forming a relationship with one confessor who really gets to know you, really gets to know your struggles, what your frequent sins are, you know, what your triggers are. And at that point, you know, it's kind of a, a natural bridge into spiritual direction at that point. Um, so you can always, most priests say, you know, if you need to make, go to confession, make an appointment. We'll reach out to them then and make an appointment, even if it's not during the regular confession time at your parish. Um, and start to form a relationship with your priest. Um, but there also are directories of some spiritual directors. Um, and I believe that you can find those fairly easily. Spiritualdirection.com is a resource for those who are looking for more information on spiritual direction as well. And for those who are listening, remember, there's probably nothing you've done that the priest hasn't heard before, you know, so don't flatter yourself in thinking that your sins are that original because they probably aren't. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Sam, thanks so much for being our guest. How can folks find out more about the good work you're doing? The CatholicGentleman.net uh, is the hub for all things related to Catholic Gentlemen. Also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of the typical social networks, putting out content pretty regularly there. Also available on Apple uh, Podcasts, our most major podcast platforms. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.